Okay, uh, Per, are you with us? Yeah, hello to everyone. I'm muting myself, so um, uh, Per, please um, uh, share your screen and... Um, Okay, I hope this works now. Okay, so hello to everyone. Um, this talk is uh, a summary of our experiences on using vector symbolic architectures in the field of mobile robotics. So this is joint work with uh, a lot of people uh, you can see on the screen, in particular, Kenny Schlegel, Stefan Schubert, and Peter Protzel. And we are all working in Chemnitz, and more or less all of our work is related to mobile robotics. So the first part of this talk, talk will be a little bit about this context, our application field, mobile robotics, and a particular task namely visual place recognition in changing environments. And that's a very interesting talk, uh, um, interesting topic, and it's a challenging problem. And it's so challenging that we try to use high dimensional computing to solve this problem of uh, place recognition in changing environments. And the rest of the talk will be about like, three areas where we um, use VSAs and high dimensional computing. I will explain how we use it to encode real-world robot data. I will explain shortly how we try to use it to encode context. And context is very important in all robotic applications, in many robotic applications. And we will use it in particular for place recognition using uh, cameras as the main sensor. And finally, I will talk about um, like a topic which is of broader interest for this community, I guess, the experimental comparison of several available VSA implementations. And throughout this talk, I will show little boxes like this one with open questions. Um, since we are mainly working in the field of robotics, everything related to high dimensional computing and VSAs is like, not our main field of research. So we have like more questions than we have answers right now. So whenever you feel that you have some idea to answer one of those questions, feel free to contact uh, us. We are very happy to, to work with other groups together to work towards answering some of those questions. Okay, so let's start with a little bit um, background. So we are working in the area of mobile robotics, mainly navigation tasks. So here you can see two of our robots. They're equipped with different sensors, for example, cameras or laser scanners, or um, IMUs, real odometry measure uh, sensors, and so on. They can move in unstructured rough terrain. They have uh, mobile manipulators, so they can search objects and grab them and so on. And to solve complex tasks in complex environments, we need um, complex algorithms to perceive the environment and, for example, to localize within the environment. And localization is a very important subproblem. And one part of localization is visual place recognition. And I will use this as a use case where we apply vector symbolic architectures. So this is an illustration of visual place recognition, mainly an image retrieval task. Assume that we have uh, the current camera view from a robot or a self-driving car shown on the left. And we have a data set of known places, a database, um, illustrated by the video on the right side. And now the question is, which frame from the video corresponds to the current image from, from the robot? And this is a pretty basic computer vision task. And there are a lot of algorithms to approach this problem, something like uh, scale invariant, invariant uh, feature transform. We can use SIFT features to match those places. But it turned out that if we have the case of changing environments, those standard approaches do not work well. And changing environments are illustrated here. Instead of having the same environmental conditions, the same weather, the same season between the database and the query, in those changing environments, these 
conditions changed quite dramatically, for example, from a sunny summer day to localizing in a rainy winter night. So here the situation is, for example, we have a database which is captured through day, and then we move through the environment during night or evening and still want to localize. We want to match those images. Okay, and this will be the uh, example task for our application of VSAs. Let's start with high dimensional encodings of real world robot data. And this will mainly focus on, on images. But let's start a little bit more abstract or basic. When we look at VSAs, we can ask the questions, okay, where do vectors come from in a VSA? And I think there are like three sources. They can first be the result of a VSA operation, or they are random vectors, for example, created to encode something like a role. And the third case, we might want to systematically encode real world entities, for example, sensor measurements or a place in the world. So we want to ground the hypervectors in the real world. And this poses uh, some challenges. For example, the mutual similarity of those vectors of encodings of real world entities, those similarities have to be carefully balanced. So for example, in this context of place recognition, if we have multiple images showing the same place, we want them to be similar. But if we have images of different places, we want them to be dissimilar. And this has to be ensured by, by this encoding. And here directly comes our first big question. So from a VSA perspective, what are desirable properties of such encodings? So far, we worked um, a lot on this, on this problem and worked with a lot of different um, descriptors, image descriptors. And uh, in the following, I will show some of the, of the results. But if you have um, any clue towards answering this question, uh, I'll be happy to, to hear it. OK, I will demonstrate some, some results, um, not from data from Sweden. I think we've seen some uh, uh, in the previous talk. But now we have some images from, from Norway. And I will work with the Norland data set, which is image, uh, imagery from a train journey through northern Norway, 800, 800 kilometers, once each season. So for each place along the, this railroad, we have four images, one in spring, one in summer, one in fall, and one in winter. And now the task is to recognize that some of those images show the same place and other images show different places. And if we try to use an existing classic recognition approach like SIFT, which I mentioned earlier, to solve this task, SIFT is an algorithm that extracts local landmarks and computes descriptors, so vector, vectors of numbers describing those landmarks, and then we can use them to compare uh, the landmarks between two images. If you use the SIFT approach, to try to, to find images showing the same place along this uh, train rate, train, uh, train journey across uh, Norway from different seasons, then this will fail. And we can see this in this precision recall curve. And all you have to know about precision recall curves is that a good algorithm is located on the top right, so somewhere over here. And SIFT is on the bottom left, so it does not work well in this particular setup. In general, SIFT is a wonderful algorithm, but not for changing environments. However, it turned out that if we use a high dimensional descriptor from a convolutional neural network, this works quite well. Um, but what exactly is such a CNN descriptor? It can basically be the flattened output of an early convolutional layer of a classification network, for example, LXNet. So we can use an existing standard network, feed our image from a place into uh, the network, run a set of parallel and sequential convolutions, but not until the very end of, which would be the classification result, for example, seeing a face, a cat, or a car, but we stop after a few convolutions. So for example, uh, if we use AlexNet, it's a good idea to stop after three convolutional layers, and then the output is a three-dimensional tensor. So this AlexNet provides us an algorithm to input an image, 
and get a three-dimensional tensor, tensor that describes this image um, with a spatial resolution of 13 by 13. And for each of those locations, we have a 384-dimensional descriptor to describe this part of the image. And if we take all those values and compute a flattened single descriptor, we get a very high dimensional vector with almost 65,000 dimensions. And it turned out that we can use this vector directly to describe an image. So if you want to know which images correspond between the spring journey and the winter journey, we compute such a descriptor for each image and then can compare them pairwise. And the nearest neighbor is very likely to, to show the, the same place. And this is very interesting since this original AlexNet was designed to do object classification, not place recognition. And of course, there are other neural networks that are trained directly for place recognition, for example, NetFlap, which provides also a high dimensional descriptor, which is comparatively small, but still high dimensional and works also very well for, for place recognition. And so those high dimensional descriptors from convolutional, new, convolutional neural networks are well established for, for place recognition in changing environments. But let's have a, a closer look on the properties of, of those descriptors, in particular from a VSA perspective. If we have a set of images, here are three examples from uh, the Norland data set, the spring sequence. We can compute the descriptor for each image and then compute the histogram of all the values within those descriptors. And not surprisingly, we can see that those values are more or less normal distributed. They range from, let's say, a minus 300 to plus 300. And if we look carefully, we can see that the mean value is not zero. So far, so good. Um, this doesn't tell us too much about the uh, suitability to, for, for combination with uh, vector symbolic architectures. What's more interesting is the pairwise similarity of, uh, of these descriptors. So now we have um, two data sets, once the spring sequence and the winter sequence, and we create two histograms. One, the blue one, for comparing uh, descriptors of different places, and one, the red one, when comparing descriptors of the same place. And we can see that the mutual distance of descriptors showing different places are much higher than those showing the same place. And this is very good from a place recognition perspective because this enables us to like separate those places. There will be some errors here, but we can achieve an overall place recognition performance, which is quite good. But from a vector symbolic architecture perspective, uh, there might be a big problem because um, images or descriptors from different places are not quasi orthogonal. So their mutual cosine distance is not close to one. But there is a, a simple trick to, to overcome this, this problem. Um, we can apply a statistical standardization. Uh, so basically what we do is if we have a set of images from spring, we compute the mean spring descriptor so the mean value per dimension and subtract this from all spring descriptors. And this has two effects. First of all, we can even more separate these two distributions. So we can improve the separation between true and false matches, which is good for base recognition. But this also creates this quasi orthogonality of descriptors of different places. On a very abstract level, we can think of trying to remove the, like the season from the place descriptor. So if we have a place recorded in spring, then we might think of the descriptor being the combination of like spring and some information about the place itself. And now we try to subtract the spring information so we only have the information about the place. Um, this is a very abstract view and does not really work that way, but it's maybe helpful to think a little bit of uh, what we're trying to do uh, in, in, in that way. 
So to, to do this, we require information about um, the season of, of each image. And in a very recent work, Stefan, who can, uh, which can be seen here, uh, provided some in very interesting insights what we can do in cases where we have like a more complex setup. For example, we have a robot that moves in an environment while this environment is changing. So for example, the, the robot starts in afternoon and then uh, it traverses the environment until evening into night. And we still want to uh, use something like the standardization to somehow remove part of the environmental change. If you look in, uh, into this paper, you can uh, find the details of this uh, algorithmic approach. You will find also some interesting properties or some interesting approach to do something like a change removal by applying a principal component analysis. Whenever we work with those uh, CNN descriptors, it's very likely that we include some kind of dimensionality reduction. We do not really work with a 65,000 dimensional um, descriptor, but we know that since they are created from real world images, they only live in a, in a subspace of this very high dimensional space, which is also why this standardization is, is a good idea. Um, and it's also a good idea to reduce the number of dimensions. And if you use a principal component analysis, um, there's this interesting case where you do not remove the least important dimensions, but the most important dimensions to create a, dim a descriptor of a lower dimensionality. And here the, the concept is that the um, dimensions with the uh, greatest importance might capture only information about like the overall appearance, which is strongly influenced by the environmental conditions. So if you're interested in this, please look into this paper or uh, contact Stefan directly. And here again, an open question. Um, how we can address these changing environments in a particular vector symbolic way, really dealing with like symbolic knowledge about seasons, but we do not really see how to do this yet. So we think of something like using a not operator, have something like, okay, a place is like the combination of a season and information about the place. So if we remove the seasonal information with something like a orthogonal projection or some other implementation of a not operator, this might be yeah, helpful. Okay. Um, so this is um, a summary of what we have seen so far. We use images. CNNs, some form of standardization, maybe dimensionality reduction, but we do not yet really have a VSA vector, right? It's just a high dimensional vector. And to create a VSA vector, we use quite a couple of different techniques. Um, again, some kind of normalization, locality sensitive hashing, some thresholding, some algorithms to create a sparsity and so on. And information about those approaches are scattered around a couple of papers. There's no single resource where you can find how we create a, a vector for a particular VSA for, from, from such, uh, such a CNN. Um, and I think that's maybe in general a problem. There are only like few insights uh, about general approaches or, or guidelines, how to encode sensor data or state information. So this is also an, an open question where we are really uh, hope hope for some, some input from the community. Okay, now let's assume that we have yeah. any comments. Any comments? Uh, I uh, assume that somebody, somebody has, has uh, mic uh, on. Can you check that uh, your mic is off, those who listen to this webinar? Okay, so I think I will proceed. Um, so far we have a way to create high dimensional vectors to describe images, but what can we do with, with those images? And I will shortly describe three example applications. So the first will be a simple object recognition tasks from multiple views. Then we will proceed with um, a high dimensional computing implementation of sequence them for place recognition, and then 
a short introduction to how we used hierarchical temporal memory for place recognition. Um, and I think this is maybe the, the biggest question uh, that we have in Chemnitz. Is there some hopefully robotic application where VSAs can really make a difference? So for example, where we can solve a problem that could not be solved before at all, or solve the problem better. And so in the talk before and, and last week, we have seen some examples. So I'm quite optimistic that there are uh, such applications where we can be, for example, more accurate, faster, or more energy efficient. And I will try to like, highlight for those three examples that I'm going to explain a little bit where I see such a benefit from, from VSAs. But to be honest, in many applications, I think VSAs are often a way to also implement some algorithm that could also be implemented without using VSAs. But I think that's a great topic for, for discussion. Okay, let's start with this very uh, simple object recognition. Uh, example. This is also explained in this uh, introductory paper uh, in the German Journal of Artificial Intelligence from last year. There you can read about the details. Here the setup is we have a database with 1,000 objects and in fact the objects are tiny images with an object in front of a black background and we compute a high-dimensional CNN descriptor for each image. And then we have a query and the query is another image of the same object from a different perspective. So from a slightly different viewing angel, for example. And now the question is, what happens if we have for each object two views? So for example, from the front or from the side, and our query is somewhere in between, what happens to, to our database if we want to do something like a nearest neighbor query? So basically we can assume that we have for a linear search here, twice as many comparisons. So if we do this naive implementation. So we have twice as many comparisons if we have twice as many images of objects. But we can think that we might be better able to, to recognize the objects if we have additional views of them. But at the cost of um, more computational effort, unless we bundle the views. And I think that's quite intuitive for everyone working with uh, high dimensional vectors. We can, for example, just average those descriptors. And we did this and we um, run some experiments and I want to shortly summarize the, the outcome. So here we have a plot where we have the accuracy on the vertical axis and the horizontal axis describes the angular distance of the viewing angle. So for example, here we have like a zero degree viewing angle and a 90 degree, and this one might be from 45 degree. So the result for this query is located here. And we can look at the results for using individual views. So storing twice as many images at each image individually is the blue curve. And the red curve, which uses the bundle, can be computed faster because we do not need to store more vectors because we have more views. And it's even more accurate. It's only slightly more accurate, but at least it's not worse than using individual views. Moreover, we can also bundle more views. So for example, for each object view, like a frontal view, a view from the background and from the two sides. So four static views in the yellow curve or even eight static views. And then you will see that um, the representation becomes more and more robust or even invariant towards uh, new viewing angles in the query as expected. Okay, however, the big question, does this scale to a real world problem? And I'm not quite sure. We did not test this yet with uh, real world images. I could think of an application where we, for example, have a tracking, a tracking task and we try to observe a car from the back. Then we um, have also a few from the side and still want to recognize this, this, the same car, but we did not try this yet. So this would be very interesting. Okay, let's move on to another task. Um, now we, had, we are at the place recognition problem and we want to encode temporal uh, information. Um, place recognition is more than just an image retrieval task. So if we think of a database sequence of images and a query sequence of images, 
then of course neighborhood images um, provide some, some overlap, some additional information. And sequence them is an algorithm that tries to exploit this information. So here we have the pairwise similarity matrix of all database images and all um, query images. And sequence them tries to accumulate information across uh, a sequence of images. So those three uh, database images and these three query images are evaluated simultaneously. So and what uh, it's doing basically is it runs over such a similarity matrix in a lot of loops, in a lot of nested loops. And um, the first set of loops goes across all entries, and there is a second inner loop that goes across the temporal sequence. So if, for example, I want to um, use the information of 10 consecutive images, then I have an inner loop over 10 images. And that's quite uh, important because using a vector symbolic uh, approach, we can try to encode all this sequential information in a single vector. And I think that's quite standard for, uh, for this community. Uh, typically, this would be done using um, permutations. We do it by using a role vector that encodes the position within the sequence. But the basic idea is that we create a single descriptor that combines all the information in a single hypervector by encoding the uh, CNN descriptor, bind it to a role, and then bundle across the whole sequence. And this allows to completely eliminate this inner loop. So we can use this to save runtime. And here you can see some results that we are also able to improve the performance. The longer the sequence length, the more to the top right in this precision recall curve we get. However, again, um, we might save some runtime, but at the cost of dealing with very, very high dimensional vectors. And in principle, we can also implement this without uh, vector symbolic architectures. So there's this general questions. So what are potential limitations in using VSAs for encoding temporal and spatial context of real world data? And another approach that we uh, think is related to VSAs, although it does not directly use the uh, VSA operations, is hierarchical temporal memory. Um, due to the limited time, I will skip this part but refer to uh, this paper where you can see some results where we actually implemented this approach which works on, works on high dimensional vectors and we are able to outperform all existing techniques to, to solve this problem in robotics. So this might be a, an application where it really helps. And um, I want to skip to, to show you uh, shortly some results of a comparison that Kenny Schlegel did on evaluating different properties of existing VSAs. So different vector spaces and different operators. And he compared those eight different uh, VSAs listed here, overviews all their properties in this uh, paper. And very interestingly, um, he creates this taxonomy of different properties of VSA operations. So if we look at binding implementations, we can see that there are different types. They can be multiplicative or additive, self-inverse or non-self-inverse, approximate, invertible, or exact invertible. And dependent on their particular implementations, we get those individual VSAs with quite different properties. And there are a lot of questions uh, regarding those different implementations. For example, are there any efforts towards a unifying axiomatic definition or a uniform notation, for example? However, uh, Kenny also provides a lot of uh, practical experiments where you, for example, conduct this experiment with, those, um, with this database of objects implement, uh, implemented with different VSAs and compares their capacity to store different uh, uh, different vectors in, in a single vector. Okay, unfortunately, I have to skip those results so that there is time for um, some discussion. And uh, thank you for your attention. All right, thank you very much, Pear. Uh, indeed, uh, excellent presentation. <laughs>
Uh, I have some questions to you. Uh, so I, I go to, um, well, I, I, I will go bottom, uh, bottom up, basically. Uh, first question, um, did you do some comparison between uh, sex slam and other visual based slam methods? For example, popular o ORB slam. Yeah, um, ORB slam or OB slam. Orb slam. Slam. Yeah. Orb slam is a technique that works on single images. So the interesting property of Seek Slam is that we can use Orb Slam to create the similarity matrix. And then after that, uh, use Sequence Slam to post process the output of Orb Slam. And um, very interestingly, we can see in this table, so these are results of our hierarchical temporal memory implementation, we can see that there are uh, different data sets, different CNN front ends, and sequence slam is evaluated. And those red arrows here show that in some cases, sequence slam can create worse results than the pairwise dis uh, descriptor comparison, but the like, high dimensional vector related uh, HDM implementation from this paper uh, even outperform sequence slam by quite a big margin on those data sets. All right, thank you. So um, I, I think we still have time for a couple of more questions. Um, so slide slide 59. Um, you, um, just a second. Uh, you tried using binding operation together with bundling. Is that correct? Um, for this experiment, there is only bundling involved. In the VSA comparison paper of Kenny, there is a very similar experiment where also binding is involved. So where he binds the, let's say, filler descriptors to rows, and then tries to query for rows and queries from within those uh, bindings after bundling. So this is an example where we only use a bundling. For the sequence lamp implementation, we use binding and bundling. And for the, or in the evaluation paper, um, all operations are evaluated to some extent. Um, and then I, 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 I... I still have a question. I think it is, it's about the uh, beginning of your presentation. Uh, so it's more specific question. Uh, how many layers is in AlexNet? So, um, so that you, I mean, I, I think it's in the beginning of your presentation when you uh, um, flat, flatten the representations. So, um, so we are using the third convolutional layer. I think AlexNet ha has like five convolutional layers before uh, fully connected layers. But I'm not sure about that. But we are using the third convolutional layer. Uh, uh, okay, just a second. So, um, and there is an evaluation paper by Nico Sünderhoff, who evaluated the suitability of each of those layers for this place recognition task. So there you can really see um, that the that the robustness towards environmental changes decreases with increasing number of layers, but the robustness towards viewpoint changes increases. Um, then I, I, I have um, a long uh, question slash comment from Tony Plate, but uh, instead of reading it aloud, so, uh, Tony, probably you can uh, enable your microphone and ask it uh, directly. Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. So. Yeah. Very interesting talk, Pierre. Thank you. Um, so one of the. So you. You know, one of the things you were you were bringing up was the question of you know, are, are there any things that you can do with the VSAs? You know, do VSAs help do things that you can't do with other techniques, or or do them faster? And. One of the, you know, one of my motivations for being interested in, in VSAs was was the ability to, to represent hierarchical relationships and, and things like um, part-hole relationships and containment relationships 
and hierarchical sort of hierarchical structures. And but I didn't see that much of that in the problems that you were talking about. It seemed more focused on on individual items and sequences. And so I was wondering whether there's problems that you're dealing with in in the robotics where those kind of um, hierarchical the, the ability to represent hierarchical relationships is really important and whether that would be a, a fruitful area for for where VSAs can can help you do things that that you know make possible things that aren't that are difficult or impossible with other representational techniques um. I think uh, hierarchies are a big, uh, big topic in robotics at, um, for, for many tasks. So for example, if we're talking about this localization task, um, there's something like hierarchical localization. So I can uh, have an image and first try to uh, figure out from which country this, this image is, and then from which city, and then going down, down to which part of the city, which street, which building, and so on. So there's of course, a hierarchy also involved there. But I, my, my problem is sometimes I do not see, um, I guess this is my fault, I do not see how this, uh, the VSA implementation helps to uh, process this hierarchy more efficiently than really parsing the hi hierarchy. Yes. Yes, I get you on that one. I do not see how it helps there either. The um, so one one area. I mean, I think that one one topic where where hierarchies are very important is like actions and action sequences that you can that you can break down hierarchically. And so, you know, I, I don't know whether you've done any work there, and and whether and whether VSAs might be useful in in representing that kind of thing. So, um, I don't know if you no noticed, but uh, our robots do have like robot arms, so uh, manipulators, so they can perform actions like driving around and and mani manipulate things. So, if there is a, a nice way to approach this topic with uh, VSAs as well, I would love to, to also dive in, delve into to this. Okay. I mean, uh, a lot of, of current problems in robotics are really about um, robust interaction with the world. I mean, that's the basic of, of robotics, embodied uh, intelligence, which interacts with the world. I mean, that's, that's robotics. Hello, this is um, Chris Simkin speaking. Hi. Um, on, the, on the subject of hierarchies, uh, we're presenting um, in two weeks' time, I believe, myself and Graham Bent, and we've been um, um, researching the use of VSAs for workflow. And in terms of hierarchy, we, we have the concept of uh, some high-level workflow that has to be uh, carried out, for example, baked bread or something, and then that consists of multiple smaller steps embedded in, in the VSA, there's a hierarchy. And um, in particular, it, it gives us advantage when we do this in a distributed environment. So we've got the idea of um, multiple small robots communicating peer to peer, and um, you have the idea of um, intermediate nodes in the hierarchy are considered um, sub workflows or cleanup steps, and that works uh, very well. We've been having some success with that. Yeah, I mean, uh, also everything related to implementation on special hardware and FPGAs for energy um, efficiency, distributed representations wherever we need, like. Um, robustness uh, towards bit flips and so on. There I, I really see the, the benefit of, of VSAs. Um, for those distributed systems, it's, I think it's also very, very interesting. So um, unfortunately, I'm, although I'm, I'm working in the area of robotics, I'm very much um, restricted to like sequential processing on a normal CPU. And that's my, my way of thinking about things. Maybe I should uh, adapt this a little bit to be more um, VSA compatible.
but maybe uh, uh, there are some applications to swarm robotics in this case. I mean, thinking about uh, distributed. Um, well, uh, there is a command from uh, Alex Kelly uh, uh, in in the chat uh, about the AlexNet uh, that for some NLP syntax problems uh, he tried sim uh, similarly uh, he similarly found that representation from the middle layers of a deep network uh, are most useful as they are most abstracted from the input output. So it's interesting that uh, it's true again here for place recognition. Right, uh, well, I guess we ran out of questions uh, in the chat and I, we are running out of time. So it's, uh, well, well, not totally close to midnight, but uh, here, but uh, nevertheless, it's uh, past 11. So thank you very much, Pear, for your presentation and discussions. Uh, thank you, uh, everybody, for attending this webinar. So we see each other in two weeks' time. So stay tuned and, uh, and enjoy the sunset here in Sweden. Thank you. Well, I am closing the webinar. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Pear. Bye. Bye. Bye.